John McCarthy. I'm Associate Professor of History at Robert Morris University, and the Robert Morris Oral History Center is really excited to have uh, as our guest today Carl Walpusk, who is a 38-year veteran of the Armed Forces, and Carl is going to uh, tell us about his experiences in World War II, in particular um, being one of the Forgotten 500 um, servicemen who were uh, rescued um, in Serbia uh, by uh, Chetnik forces in 1944. But Carl, I'd like to start, maybe you can tell me a little bit about your background, uh, where you grew up in Pittsburgh, um, how you ended up serving in the military and that sort of thing. Well, I didn't grow up in this area. I grew up in a little mining town in Somerset County by the name of Jenner's. And uh, my dad worked in the mines for a few years and then he got what they call black lung now. Oh, yeah. And the last years he lived, he couldn't do any manual work. So he had jobs like uh, timekeeper on WPA or night watchman at the state garage. The only thing that saved us, my mother, who had been a school teacher, got the post office appointment and became postmistress in the town of Jenner's. And it was for, well, I guess, 35 years or more in that position. And that's the only thing that really kept us going during the Depression. Right. Because Pappy wasn't able. He used to take me hunting, and uh, I went for one thing, I, and that was to jump on the brush piles and get the rabbits going because he couldn't do that anymore. And... Uh, and then if a dog lost the trail to a rabbit, my job was to go out and get that rabbit going, I guess. So he'd have something to shoot at. But uh, my dad died uh, and was at the age of 43 and was buried the day before my 20th, no, 19th birthday. But... Uh, we have something in common because uh, my mom grew up in a coal mining town in the South Hills. They didn't even give it a name; they just called it Mine Three, and it was—it's where, like, kind of where Bethel Park is today. And her dad also worked in a coal mine, and her grandfather worked in a coal mine as well. So, well, those are tough people. My grandfather was killed in 1917 in a uh, cave-in and working in the mines in Boswell. So, uh, and I'm, uh, the, 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 he, his name was Carl also. I have an uncle Carl, and I'm a Carl, and I got a nephew Carl. So <laughs> <laughs> that's going on. But out there where they lived was a whole community that had little farms very much like they do in Yugoslavia. My granddad's was originally around 40 acres, and there was five or six other farms around, and they all spoke the same language, and all came from the very same area of Europe when they came. So they'd be, they'd have church once in a while, and a minister would come in from Johnstown, and you'd see the people coming, mostly when I was, oh, probably around 12, they'd come in horse and buggy. Yeah. And, and so, that was something you don't see anymore. How old were you whenever uh, World War II broke out? And then maybe you could also just talk a little bit about if you can recall how Americans were feeling when the war started, not necessarily before, at Pearl Harbor, but like in 1939 when the Germans invade, invaded Poland. Do, was there a sense of uh, that the United States might have to be involved right away or were people kind of divided? Or I think that they're divided pretty much. And I, truthfully, I got to tell you, I had to watch my mouth very careful because the one thing my granddad did every night, he'd turn on the radio and listen to the German broadcast. So I was pretty much in, leaning toward the way he felt. And I'd get into civic discussions and the teacher never agreed with my thoughts. And I, I often wondered why the hell they left me into the 
service being. <laughs> Well, that's one of the interesting things about, you know, um, that time period that people might forget today. But the United States has a huge immigrant population from Europe. And the second uh, most numerous ethnic group in America are German Americans. And so during World War One and during, you know, World War Two, there's a lot of German Americans living in the United States. And so obviously they're going to have connections with where they came from. Oh, yeah. Well, we had a big building in town that was... German boomed meeting place because there was, you know, there was an awful lot. But my town in the, my uh, mining town, you got every nationality. Right. You name it, we had it. And the, the town was separated in that extent. Ex, extent we had a part of the town was called Little Italy. Part of the town was called Siberia. Another part was American Town. Uh-huh. And then down where I lived, it was called Hunky Town. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we all went to school and there were no problems with what nationality we were or we came from. But right. there was no uh, no problems that way. But like I said, we had, you name it, we had it. So, do you remember um, w- uh, Pearl Harbor as a, as a as a kind of a major event? Oh was, yeah. Were you out of high school by then, or? Uh, no, I was a junior in high school. Okay. So I didn't graduate until '42, and uh, that's when I was telling you when things started getting hot in the civic class, <laughs> we would get into these discussions because I, I had a, a slightly. German view of what was going on, because being uh, raised in that family, why I'm surprised my uncle was called in twice. He go, they called him in early and then uh, released them and then they recalled them. Um, what changed your mind then about about the political situation? Did you did was it serving in the military? Was it just kind of um, the way the war started to unfold? Well, I think. It, Serving in the military had a heck of a lot to do with all, my whole life. It formed you, and uh, you realized what. The heck, finally, once you got into it, you started to realize what we were trying to do versus what people thought we might be doing. So, I I've been gung ho on this uh, patriotism country ever since. I guess the first time I got shot at, that changed, that changed uh, things quite a bit. I had uh, no use for the suckers after that. Were you uh, were you drafted, Carl, or did you volunteer? No, my friends and neighbors sent me a card that said, your friends and neighbors think it's time for you to go. <laughs> <laughs> I was working in the shipyard down in Baltimore at the time when Two days after graduating, my neighbor and I were down in Baltimore. You were a longshoreman. No, well, I guess I ended up being a, a welder. Okay. And he was a ship fitter. And we stayed with a family out on the uh, Revere Beach for outside of Baltimore. There was, I guess, five or six of us from that local area that stayed with them out there. And uh, I f- even fell off a damn ship. I was sitting in dry dock, and I was going up. They have a great big ladder. All the dink on thing was probably 10 feet wide. And it would be about you know, two stories. And I'm going up, and I have all my welding equipment. And I get to take the last rung before I swung over to the side. I missed. And... I came tumbling down backwards, and the only thing that saved me because on the wharf they had these big cranes and they had tracks just like railroad tracks, and about they tell me anyhow about three rungs from the bottom my feet hit and flipped me over the railroad tracks, and I landed in in the middle between the two things. Or, if I hit the rails, I probably really got hurt. I just chipped my ankles, which 
I lived most of my life having weak, weak ankles. <laughs> so, Carl, uh, you are chosen by your, the fellow townspeople and friends to, to join. So did you select the Army then to, as your post, or...? You had no choice. Okay. It's whatever they were Needed. trying to fill quotas sure. for that day. And this is 1942? No, it was 1943. Okay. And it just so happened they were picking them for the Army Air Corps when I went through. Right. And the Army Air Corps, for people who don't know, was before the uh, Air Force was its own separate branch of the military, all of the air operations in the American military were under the Army until oh, after yeah. World War II. Well, before that, they were under the Signal Corps. Right, right. So... Uh, and you did your training, uh, where did you guys, where, where did you do basic training? And this is the good part. Atlantic City, New Jersey. Oh, wow. In a hotel. We were on the fifth floor. Nice room with a bath and all that stuff. The only problem was trying to keep that sucker clean for inspection. <laughs> and the other problem was if you got downstairs for a roll call and they changed the uniform, they wouldn't let you use the elevator. You had to use the stairs to go back up, get whatever it was, <laughs> back down. That's great. And so how long were you in Atlantic City for? Well, I guess it was eight weeks. And, and obviously they're looking for places to train people anywhere they can because they're at maximum capacity and all the normal bases are over overfilled already and that sort of thing. Is that? Oh, yeah. When it uh, rained, we went up to the convention center and trained inside the convention center. And then every morning we'd walk out to the beach singing, and I bet you the people along the route, you know, it'd be dark yet, and we're singing she wore a yellow ribbon or something like that. <laughs> you see the lights come on. People knew it was time to get up. Were you hoping, it was, w w did you know whenever you went to Atlantic City that you were going to be sent to uh, to Europe, to Italy, or did, was there a chance you could be going to the Pacific at that point? When, it, when, did, when, when did you find out what part of the world you were headed to? I didn't find out until a couple, well, a couple of months after that because I went for advanced training, you know, I went up to uh, Brookings, South Dakota State College there right. and took my advanced training on the administration. And then from there I went to Salt Lake City, which uh, was a replacement depot where you waited and they assigned you to a unit. And then they signed me to Almogordo, New Mexico with the uh, 449th Bomb Group. Wow. Okay, so that when you were in New Mexico, that's whenever you knew that you were headed to. And the and the this is right whenever the, the United States and Britain are about to take over Italy, right? In oh the yeah. 19, this fall of 1943. Oh yeah. And that's a major part of the Allied operations, the soft underbelly of the of the of the German fortress. Yep. Yeah. When we shipped out of uh, Nebraska, we went. On Hampton Roads, Virginia, to board a ship, and it was a Liberty ship that was converted into a troop ship, and we had the upper holds, and there was at least I can't swear to gosh, but there was at least three bunks high, maybe even four, where you slept, and I think I said this before, you didn't want to be on the bottom bunk because. I don't know anybody that wasn't sick. You weren't allowed to go out on deck or anything. Wow. And uh, so you... And how long, was the, how long was the trip? I think it was around seven to nine days. Wow. You know, you were in convoy right. and you do all that zigzagging. And I know one thing though, when we hit Chevalier, I snuck up every night on deck. <laughs> Just to get some fresh air? No, submarines. Oh. When you hit the Mediterranean, that was right. big submarine territory. Right, right, and right. I was going to get stuck down there with 300 guys trying to get up one flight of stairs. <laughs> yeah, right. Try to talk about a traffic jam, right? Yeah. So uh, I so slept. The, the, the boat, uh, 
made uh, docked in, in Sicily or Italy? No, we Parker docked or? in uh, Oran, Africa. North Africa. Yeah. Oh, okay. And we spent Christmas of 43 in Oran. Okay. And uh, we was only there for maybe a week or two and shipped out for Italy and Naples had just been cleared and uh, stayed overnight in a bombed out building, which was, I never knew it got that cold in Italy. It, it, you know, Naples it, to southern Italy, no less, right? Yeah, yeah. particularly. And it, it was colder than I was going around trying to find some cardboard or anything because it was a towel or concrete floor and all you had was your two blankets and man that was cold and the other thing we didn't get to leave that post because of one thing the uh, Indian Gurkhas were guarding that area I don't know if you heard about the Gurkhas they carry a big blade so it's not a sword, it's a knife about that wide, and that's what they fight with. Wow. <laughs> we was all as scared to try to sneak out because one of them suckers might cut your head off. So what your, your bombing mission um, was, what was your target whenever you guys were flying your uh, sortie over? Over Yugoslavia, well, well, our target was Polesti. Okay. The oil fields, and uh, in Romania, correct? Right. So again, just to uh, clarify for our listeners, Romania was occupied by Germany. It's a country in Eastern Europe, and it was had probably the, the was probably the richest oil fields in all of Europe, except for maybe Russia. Yeah. And so it was a really, really valuable part of Germany's war making capacity, and it was a really key strategic part of Eastern Europe. And it, it was the most heavily defended target we had right. in the whole 15th Air Force. You know, I flew over Bucharest and Budapest and uh, Toulon, France, for <laughs> the submarine pens and places like that. So did you take off from a base in Italy? And then you would fly over the Balkans, obviously. Um to get to Romania, which is a little bit north, yeah. and kind of east of the Balkans, and then turn around and fly back. Yeah. Okay. It was about as far as you could go right. in our airplanes. Right, right. That's why we, from where we were, we could never fly up to Germany because it was out of our range. Right. Now, maybe later on, probably in 45, when they moved up, a, a, <coughs> excuse me, above Rome and through there, right. they could probably fly into Germany and bomb up there. Right. And that's another reason why it was so important to take North Africa and Italy to establish those bases to be able to hit uh, the Germans in Romania, because before that, obviously, they would be unable to do that, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, even my the bomb group I joined in 98th, when they were stationed in Africa, they flew on, I don't know if you ever heard about it, but the bombing of Palesti, but they went in low level. They flew at around 200 feet. Wow. There must have been a lot of casualties at that. There was a lot of... Altitude. Uh, well, the big... Not only that, as they were flying up, part of the formation flew up toward Bucharest. And the, the capital rest, city of Romania. Right? Yeah. And the uh, rest kept on target toward Palesti. So by the time these guys realized it, they were behind schedule probably by 15 minutes or so. So when the first group went over and dropped their bombs, they were time delayed. And by the time the second group came and started over, these bombs were exploding. Oh, wow. So the they were getting the, is difficult and get the heck knocked out of them on that. Wow. So can you talk about um, parachuting down into Serbia and, and uh, that whole uh, part of the... Well, uh, you know, it, it's funny how when you're flying and, uh, you know, fly, shooting, 
you really don't know where you're at. You, you're not paying attention. You know how you went. But anyhow, when you're getting flack, that's the scary part. You can't do anything. Right. You can't change course. You can't do anything. You got to accept what's coming up. Right. And you see bursts all around you, and you see airplanes going down. And you, yet you got to take the same path. Right. You can't. You avoid can't it. change. It's too late. Right. Too late. So that that, that that's the scary part of uh, flying on a mission, where particularly in these air. Heavily defended areas. There's right. And not much you can do. Nowhere, I guess, if you're if you're in the plane. And then the one thing you know, if you're going to get fighters, you're going to get fighters after you bombed. Right. They're out there waiting. Right. So they can come down out, out of the sun to pounce upon you. Right. But anyhow, we got up sh shot pretty good now in that book of 500. My navigator describes so what we got the hit now i was in the same airplane and I, no way do i know where in the hell we got hit the way we said i know we got hit and it took our hy hydraulic system out because right. he he couldn't work the elevators in the back and stuff like that and we dropped out of formation and was flying by ourselves by the end but uh Parachuting to me, I would do it again. Once that chute opens and you get out of that initial shock, there's nothing more beautiful than floating down. So is that a strange experience? You're in an airplane, you're you're uh, you're you know engaging with the enemy. It's kind of a, a scary thing, and then you all of a sudden have to jump out of this plane, and now there's this sort of peaceful moment where you're kind of floating over. It is. It's, you know, it's funny. Like, I think I said this the other day that uh, I don't know how the left waist beat me out. because He did. Because the bell just rang and uh, I'm putting on my parachute and taking off the gas mask, or oxygen mask, and I look around, he's gone. And even after I jumped out, I couldn't see him in the sky around me. Because it We'd covered that, that that much distance yeah. between us, but that was uh, something that I always uh, kind of liked. It, remembering that drop down through the atmosphere, yeah. beautiful. And you did you have any idea while you were in the air about where you were at all? No clue. No right? clue. Because you're just kind of flying over wherever. Yeah. And how many people were on the plane with you again? Eleven. Eleven, okay. Eleven, we, uh, and we lost the ball gunner. He went down with the airplane. Okay. And, uh, but, uh, the other ten? The other ten up. all made it out. And, uh, you know, all of us got wounded. Nothing, none of us really serious. I got nicked twice, but... I think most of the rest of us, same thing. None of us got really hit bad, or you couldn't go anywhere. But uh, as I was telling the people the other day, once I got close to the ground, I realized, hey, bud, you're moving. <laughs> you go a lot faster than you realize, huh? Oh, yeah. I, I compare, like jumping off the roof of this building yeah. here. Yeah, wow. A pretty good jump. Yeah. When you hit that cotton picking ground, and I hit I was right into a bunch of brushes and stuff. Nothing big, but <laughs> it scratched me up a little bit. Yeah. And you're in a pretty heavily forested part of central Serbia? Yeah. Well, it's no big trees where we landed. This is nothing but scrub for acres and acres there. And it's uh, 80 or 90 miles south of Belgrade? Is that abruptly? It's about 80 to 90 to Belgrade. Okay. The only reason I know this, when we got, met this one young lady, she worked in Belgrade, and she was telling me, uh, 
how she got there and how far it was. Right, right, yeah. So whenever you guys landed, um, did people approach you right away, or did you kind of get your bearings together and get together and then go find, figure out where you were by going to find? No, I met two of them immediately, but when I landed and started taking off my harnesses and stuff, I looked up the hill and there was two soldiers standing with rifles and uh, I had to make up my mind and it, which wasn't very long. Figure out which side they were on. Yeah, and w if I was going to take my 45 right. <laughs> and try to battle two guys <laughs> with a rifle. <laughs> but uh, now that I decided not to and I walked up to them. And they identified themselves as... Yeah. And, uh, Did they identify themselves as Serbian or Yugoslavian or Chetnik or? You couldn't understand their okay. language. Right, right. I still didn't know who they were. Yeah. All yeah. I knew that they weren't captured me and would. Yeah, right, right away. You know, they're not German at least. <laughs> they weren't German. So they motioned and, and we followed them, or me, me, me by myself, followed them for about 45, 50 minutes. And I was, was so doggone hot, I had my flying sheepskins on yet, and I started shedding that stuff. And I told the, the people how uh, this lady was standing along the road, and I, I was sweating and needed a drink, and I motioned, and she went up and got that, that big glass of supposedly water and gave it to me, and I had one big swallow down, the other one going, when it just took my breath away. It just shut down. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't do anything. And this is the, the, the Rajika or the... R Rakia. Rakia, that's right. The, the, which is like a plum brandy, is that right? Yeah, it's plum. Yeah, very strong. I still have a bottle, and anybody comes visit me, Start bragging about drinking. I bring that. <laughs> I bring that up. <laughs> Try this. <laughs> Try this. <laughs> and it's a very common drink in the Balkans, obviously. Oh, it it's is all over the place down there, right? Oh, well, again, I think they picked up that we must be drinkers because there wasn't a meal that I know of that they didn't give us a glass of rakia. And at first, you know, you didn't like it. But after a day or two, you, you started looking forward to getting that <laughs> snort because you, you were kind of happy the rest of the day. <laughs> but, yeah, when the closer we got to town, then I, I came out with two horses. And, because by, by that time, I had met up with a left waist gunner, and they put us on the horses. and took us into town, and uh, when we got into town, there's a platoon came out and paraded past us and saluted, and then they took us down to this house. There might have been 10, 12 homes in that village, and when the men started celebrating, drinking and eating, and that's down how we tried to go to sleep, and the suckers just stood at the bottom of the bed singing, and we couldn't sleep, because by that time we were pooped. We, uh, you know, we get up around five, and I'm not sure what time it was. I don't even know the, if there's any difference between Italy and Yugoslavia on time or right, not. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> But that went on for quite a while. So you were uh, staying at this village, and you had said uh, in your talk at Robert Morris that you ended up sleeping most of the time in a hayloft. Is that right? Any time we uh, moved, the only place that these homes weren't big enough to put you in, you right. know, ten people. Right. So they had a, all of them had small barns, and we'd all go up and sleep in the hayloft. Right. One, it kept you out of the rain, and two, you had at least something softer to sleep on than the ground. Ground, yeah, yeah. 
And you were there for 33 days, is that correct? Yeah. We were the youngest crew as far as being down. All the other ones were down a lot longer. Some of them were down close to 300 days. Right. And uh, we were only down 33 days. And the goal becomes they would have to build an airstrip big enough to get to get planes out so you guys can get taken out and returned to... Well, they had the strip virtually all built by the time we came. All they seen them doing up there was going around trying to find little rocks and stuff like that. Right. And any time they had anybody on the airstrip that had some cattle out there so you would act like you're herding the cattle because they flew reconnaissance planes over it every now and then. And again, for the audience, Serbia and Yugoslavia were already occupied by the Axis forces, Germany and Italy together. And so there's a resistance movement going on, obviously, in Serbia. Uh, fight, and, and so the Chetniks are, they have to be kind of incognito, right? Because they're in occupied territory. So when you talk about reconnaissance missions, it's the Germans watching these people, correct? Oh, yeah. Well, there, were, there was actually three forces in Yugoslavia. You had the Chetniks, you had the partisans led by Tito, right. which was communists, and they had a much larger force. Right. And you had the Italian-German faction. Now, the Germans occupied all the towns, uh, all the major villages, but they couldn't come up in the mountain and take over a 10, 15 house. Right. This is very, um, it's very far away from population centers. It's very rural. There's no real strategic reason for the Germans to have a big presence there, so it's a good place to hide people. Yeah, we never, I, I never seen a, a bit of electricity. I never seen yeah. a, a store or anything like that right. around. These people lived on what, I, I assume they made their own clothing and everything from right. what I've seen. Right, that's really something. And the Chetniks are sort of fighting the partisans and the Nazis kind of at the same time, right? So there's kind of a civil war going on in Yugoslavia, and there's also, of course, World War II going on at the same time. Right. See, the one thing I found out about the Balkans, those people don't like each other, they don't care where they're from, what country they're from, and they just soon fight each other. And the bad part, I... I would never want to go up against, they are mean suckers. They, they would think nothing had taken off your head, or they like the knife and the sword, and I hate knives and swords. <laughs> well, they, and they had a, and that area had a reputation for fierce fighting in World War One. whenever, of course, the uh, Serbians are fighting to get freedom from Austria-Hungary, and that's one of the reasons how World War I starts. And that's a really intense fighting going on in, in Yugoslavia during World War I, so they have this reputation, and it became one of the most difficult places for the, the Nazis and the Italians to, to occupy. Oh, yeah. That's, I still can't get it into my head. You take the Serbs and the Croatians, don't like each other. They'll fight in a minute. But here in Moon Township, I know some Serbs, I know some Croatian. No problem. Right, right. But put them over there. <laughs> First thing you want to do is fight. And Pittsburgh does have a very large Serbian American population and a very large Croatian American population as well. Croatians live on the north side. They lived in, uh, in Beaver County. Of course, Serbs live and the south side and Aliquippa and places. So that's what Carl's referring to. It really is an interesting thing. Culturally speaking, they are kind of together here, but obviously they've got their, their they've had their history in the in Yugoslavia. So Yeah, it's it all sorts there. I But how, did were you aware uh, that there was this civil war going on in you while you while you were in Serbia or or is your concern on a day to day basis survival, you know, getting back to the, the American military um, or could, did you get a sense that this other conflict was taking place while you were in? To a certain extent. See, the one thing I knew, and I, I don't know if the other, all the other people knew, I knew that if I got to the partisans, I'd be home in a couple of days. Right. 
they had the support of the Allies. Right. And they, I seen them in our hometown, or he had a home, the town we were based in, coming there for R&R, &R, the partisans. So I knew they were friendly with the United States. Right. But uh, I never got the chance and never took the chance because we had no idea if we was ever going to be taken out because we could never convince the CIA, not the CIA, the OSS, OSS, that we were who we said we were. Right. And that's why they dropped in Captain Mullen and a little radio man to confirm who we were and then assist. And the OSS is the Office of Strategic Services. Service. And it's the, for the precursor to the CIA. This right. Before the CIA is created in 1947, the OSS is, is our America's intelligence agency during World War II. And what you're, ta you're, what you're talking about is how you're, you're, you're telling them, look, we're, we're being protected by Chetniks, not by partisans, correct? Mm -hmm. and that, that's something that they maybe didn't believe because of the way the Civil War was going on. Is that correct? I believe that was it. And the other thing, they was afraid that the Germans were using it as a decoy, would send in troops. To get ambushed. Get, get it ambushed. That was one of the other worries about uh, coming in to get us. So the OSS shows up and, and ensures that you are, in fact, an American serviceman, and there's others there. And they... Yeah, see, before that, we didn't have a direct line into Italy. I think they went down to Greece and then out or something like that, the transmissions. But once the uh, OSS him and they had a radio with them, it would, they could talk right directly to headquarters in Italy. Right, right. They have to establish communications. And this yeah. is a, like one of the most remote areas of all of Europe where you are, actually, which might, may have been one of the reasons why you were safe because you landed in an area where the Germans weren't around. But they have to establish. They have to establish communications. <clears throat> there's no electricity. There's no sewage. There's no running water. So all this stuff has to be created out of thin air. Yeah. For this to happen. Yeah. And uh, like I said, said, I find it hard yet to believe how those people took care of us. Now you figure there was the first load that went out. There's 250 some of us that flew out one evening and the next morning. For breaking them down like we were, I assumed they kept the crews together. And since hey, that would be a minimum of 10 people. Per plane. No, per house that you stay oh, okay. at. Per, right, right. That's wow. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people to feed. Right. First, pretty small houses, probably. Yeah, and they did that every day. So if you take ten people into two hundred and fifty, that's a twenty-five crews that had to take, and you move them every day. And we never went back to the same house. So you had to be covering a big area, and a lot of people taking care of you. So the ability of these people to coordinate that kind of activity is remarkable. It because is. You have to continue to move to, to stay away from the Germans so you're not, they know you're not in one place. It takes literally hundreds of families working together, and there's no communication. It's not like they can call each other up on the telephone or text each other, and we're talking about a very wide territory. And then they have to come up with food to feed 10 very hungry servicemen on a nightly basis. Yeah. So that kind of activity is really remarkable. It is. That, that really amazed me even today. I just wonder, how in the Lord, who in the heck coordinated that? Was, you know, you, now you'd need a computer shoot to do that. Right. But they did it. That is really remarkable. Um, and I, I think this was asked of you at last week, but I'd like to ask it again. Is, have you ever been able to meet any of the people who were there, who helped kind of keep you guys going? Were you, maybe a letter back? That oh, maybe, I had a uh, couple letters from the end you of know, the first year or two I was back. I had letters mostly calling, asking for 
aid, and uh, we sent two packages back with clothes that we gathered up in the town and sent back. But as far as really doing anything to aid them, I just wasn't able to do it. Now, right. And it always kind of bugged you. you how in the hell are you going to pay those people back? And the only way I found doing it is when I go out and give these talks, I, I uh, praise up these people for right. being what they Keeping were. Keeping it alive as history yeah, um, as part of the story it was really a, a major part of being able to do that. Yeah. So um, let's go back real quick to the day that you actually were able to leave. Um, can you talk a little bit about the the trip back whenever you're, it's your turn to, I guess, get on the plane and fly back? Were you, were you scared that day that something could happen or anxious or? Well, you was anxious, but, you know, this might, might sound like bragging. I can never remember being scared, period. Maybe that, too busy to be scared. There's just too much to do. Too much to do. Right. Uh, it seems that when you were, well, at least when we were shooting at the airplanes and that, it never bo dawned on me to be scared. It gave me something to do, and I was trying like hell to undo that <laughs> situation. And uh, I don't know, uh, I've always wondered how these people get all these ailments from fighting. Now, I realize being an instrument and all that's a heck of a lot different being down on the ground and that. But the one thing that people don't realize when you're in the air, you got no ground to hide under, rocks to get into, or you're sitting there, nothing. But uh, no. And whatever hides you, like weather, that's bad for your plane too. So it's not like, oh, there's a storm, they can't see us. And we're flying through a storm. <laughs> uh, what they had their artillery set up where they would have certain batteries fire at, say, 18,000, some at 18,500 and 2,000, or so that the shells would explode at different heights. I don't think they had radar good enough to pin, right. but we used to throw out, what the hell do we call it? it it's just stuff that you hang on a Christmas tree, long strings of uh, aluminum foil. Like, uh, it'd be like a decoy. Chaff, we call it chaff. Okay. You'd throw, they'd shoot at that instead. Yeah, it would, it would supposedly file up the radar. We'd throw, oh, okay. You had to, controllers because I just like to take a big bundle and put it out there yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rather than spread it around. <laughs> did you know whenever you got on the plane, did you know where it was headed? Was it headed back to, to North Africa or was it going somewhere else, another another base or? Well, we know all we knew was going back to Italy. Just, right, back to safety, okay. And was there any, uh, so shall we say, turbulence on the flight back, or was it relatively smooth? Oh, it was relatively smooth. I was only in one flight. We had pretty good turbulence. You had to put your hands up on the ceiling to keep from being thrown all over the damn place. But generally, every flight I was on was pretty decent. The only problem you had was the temperature. See, when you fly waste, you got a wide open window. The other gunners are sitting in these turrets with plexiglass around them, right. protecting them right. from the air. And your oxygen mask used to f freeze on your face. Because it was so cold. It would be 30 below. Wow. And you could always tell a waste gunner because he had a red ring, <laughs> and you couldn't take it off until you got down and, right. and it melted a little bit so wow. you could take it off. Was it a good feeling whenever you landed in Italy then? Oh, it always was. Yeah. I, I always liked to land no matter when it was. <laughs> did you fly any more missions after uh, after that rescue then, or they you weren't let, allowed to be back? They wouldn't let you fly. Right because now you're kind of wanted. We had to, a 
co-pilot was trying to fly, and we had to pull him in the corner and say, you, you, you fly that want us to fly. <laughs> <laughs> no way. Where did you spend the, the last like year, I guess, or so, and maybe half a year of the war then? Because this is like fall of 1944 now when you're back in, in Italy. Yeah, August probably. Okay. And so from August to, I guess, the spring of 1945, it's the last you know, seven months or so of the European side of the war. I spent it down in Houston, Texas, uh, Ellison Field. Okay. Was, it, was, was, the, um, was there a lot of attention to the rescue in, in the public, or was it always kind of kept under the rug? Well, it was kept on, we was told, you will not talk about it. Okay. And that's, that's one reason, you know, there was really no publicity about it. Right. It, because they didn't want to give away any information on how it was done, where it was done, or right. anything like that. So if they knew they probably would come up and take over that airstrip and right so uh, okay Carl we're gonna go back uh, to talk a little bit about your kind of day-to-day -day life in the Serbian village you wake up on a typical day during your 33 days there uh, what goes on from morning till night what, do you, what, what... <laughs> really nothing <laughs> there was nothing to do I was on one little farm and my grandparents had a Farm and I spent every summer and half the winter on the farm. I could do anything with a team of horses that take. So the guy was making hay, and I went out and picked up a fork. I wanted to help out, and he wouldn't do it. <laughs> he wouldn't let you help. He wouldn't let me help. There was nothing you could do. All you did was hang around, bullshit. Or in some cases, and we only did this about twice, find a creek and take a bath. What did they eat? So what was your, uh, what was the, what's, what's the food like over there? Does it uh, mostly just bread or well, pork? Were, or? They always had bread, but generally it was some type of soup or some kind of meat. One time we had a... Were there a lot of pig farmers in Serbia? I thought I heard that. That, that, Maybe not that part of it. There the wasn't that many pork. They had more sheep and goats than okay. they had pigs by far. Yeah. Part and, of your mountain animals. Yeah. Right. But that was it. You couldn't do anything. I know, I remember one time, a place was, the guys ran out of tobacco, and this farmer walked somewhere and came back with some of the tobacco. But there was nothing. And, you know, there was nothing you could do with the people because you couldn't talk to them, you couldn't understand them. Right, right, right. And in most cases, they were a lot older than you. Right. So you didn't have too much. And you had mentioned that in your talk, that the age of the villagers is really old. And that's probably because their kids are fighting with the, the Chetniks, and, you know, and they're just involved in the resistance. Well, or they have moved to cities, maybe, yeah. because a lot of rural areas have been depopulated, right? I think that's what happened, because if I see any young men, they were in the Chetniks, they were in the right. soldiers. Right. I didn't see that many women, although I did see some women that were part of the Chetniks that were in uniform. Oh, wow, okay. So they had women who were f f part of the army. Wow. And that in that day and age, that's pretty rare too. It right? was. So you know, I don't know what kind of jobs they had. I don't think they had any job description. It's, yeah. You can't it's not do a formal kind of yeah. organization, right? I don't think it, you know, like you can't do this and you can't do that because you're a female. I think they went out and did whatever the hell they could. Right. Right. Because that's one thing I've seen, when like at harvest time. They, cutting wheat or oats, the women were doing all the damn work, virtually, yeah. cut, cutting it with a little sickle. And <coughs> so these were hay farms for the most part, or that was like the kind of the... the well, they had or... more like a truck patch with a, a field with wheat and some hay. Whatever you need to feed your family. Yeah. Self, yeah. 
That was the big thing, was part to feed your family and the rest to feed the animals. Right, right, right. But, uh, but they always seem busy. I, it, it reminded me so much of my grandparents. Like I said, they only had, they started off with 40 acres. They raised seven kids. Of course, the granddad worked in the mines when he could on it. They expanded the farm when I was about 15. They bought another 60 acres. The neighbor had, had the farm and left to go. And they bought it, and we started farming that. But we didn't have any modern equipment. We still looked up the butt of a horse going down through the field. Right, right. My granddad got a tractor out sometime after I left, but before that, it was always horse drawn. When I taught in Poland in 2001, I know this is a little off topic, but the, um, the school was next to a farm, and the farmer still used a horse plow in 2001. So, you know, that's kind of still that part of the world, so. Well, you'll see that in the army shuts right. the horse. Right. So, um, let's kind of move now ahead and talk a little bit about the aftermath of the conflict. And um, let's bring in uh, General Mihalovich. He's the commanding officer of the Chetniks during World War II. <coughs> and you obviously, during your stay, now realize that you're, you're being protected by, by you know, folks who are on the side of the Chetniks. And um, General Mihalovich um, is is killed at, at the end of the of World War Two, correct? Oh yeah. yeah, I was telling you how we. Tr this was in '46 when he was captured. Right. So in 1946, World War Two is over for a year now. The civil war between the Chetniks and the Partisans is still kind of going on. They're fighting for control of Yugoslavia now, and uh, General Mihalovich is captured. And go ahead, Carl. Well, he's that. captured, <clears throat> and every one of us who was in Yugoslavia knew that he was a dead man. There was no way the communists were going to let him go on because he was King Peter's chief military officer before, even after King Peter fled, it left Mihalovic virtually running what was left. And and Mihalovich, there's a royal family that governs Yugoslavia before World War II, and Mihalovich is what they would call a royalist, right? He want, he's, he's loyal to the royal family, and so his uh, political intention is to, when the war ends, for the royal family to uh, get come back, in come power. back into power. Yeah. <laughs> Tito and the partisans are uh, communist, but they're independent from the Soviet Union, and obviously, communists and fascists are fighting each other in World War II, so they're fighting the uh, the Nazis as well. So I just wanted to kind of give we, people the context. Well, of yeah, that, that was exactly it. Like I said, you had three different powers down there struggling right. to take control of the country. And uh, unfortunately, Tito's forces weren't large enough to compete with any of the other ones, really. Right. So we were just hanging the, out into the mountains doing little sabotage work and stuff like that because he had nothing. Right, right. No material to go out and, you know, really conduct a battle or anything. Right. Do so, you think um, one of the reasons why this story is not as well known as other World War II stories is, is because of the people who helped you, obviously? They, there's a saying in history that history is written by the winners. And if you're going by who wins the Yugoslavian conflict, it's obviously Tito. Oh, yes. The partisans, right? So uh, the, the folks who helped you do not come out on top. <coughs> you think that might be one of the reasons why, or the biggest reason why this story is not well known? Absolutely. Absolutely. And again, I blame the people in order to have uh, War Department and uh, Congress. They, they agreed with what happened even though stalin sold us up the crick and beat the out on us on the negotiations he won that damn part of it yet we supplied him he wouldn't have had nothing at the beginning of war if we wouldn't have been shipping ship after ship in there were loaded with material once he got his war factories and stuff going he was producing stuff really well, but 
the first couple of years, he was depending on us in Great Britain. And same way with Great Britain. They wouldn't have nothing if we wouldn't have supplied. And Roosevelt was having trouble. I seen that again last night on that Roosevelt thing with the Congress getting geared up, the factory stuff, to produce. You want to talk a little bit about Franklin Roosevelt as, as president? Obviously, he's the president of the United States during World War II. Uh, well, what, did, what did you think of him? I thought very highly, of course. I was pretty young when we had Hoover, and those memories aren't too good. We was in the deep past <laughs> depression, and... Uh, the one thing uh, Franklin did was he started by forming things like the CC camps, WPA, NYA. I worked one summer in NYA between my junior and senior year, breaking rock, building a track around the high school. Right, National Youth Administration. Yeah. Right, CCC, Civilian Conservation Corps. WPA Works Progress Administration. We wouldn't have had half the roads we had right. if it wouldn't have been for the WPA and that stuff. We wouldn't have national forests the way they were if it was for the CC camp. And I think it helped with these guys because they were virtually military trained when they were in camp. Right. It didn't have to do much to convert them into a soldier. Right, right. And right. you and you had hundreds of thousands of them spread all over this country. Right. So, so I give them credit for, you know, taking this out of the bread line and at least making life bearable. Right, right. Keeping things going. Yeah. Right. Um, and you, you said, you, you had said before we started rolling that you remembered when he died. Yeah, I was stationed down. You, Ellington Field, Texas. Not, I think it was August or September or something. No, my, I might be wrong when I found out. And I actually shed tears because, you know, from the, that was his 12th year. Yeah. So when I was only 20 then, so you figure a bigger part of my growing well, I, up. He's the president. Yeah, he was the president. Right, right. Um, if there's like one thing maybe that if, if, was there any kind of lessons that you've maybe learned from World War II you know in terms of America's role in the war if there's like any important historical lessons you think that maybe that came out of the war that we should remember or anything that you know you think kind of the American people maybe don't understand about World War II even though it's talked about quite a bit well, World War II is really the only war that I personally think that we should have got into. I'm not convinced that these other Korea and Vietnam and all those are wars that we should have got into. But this is a war that you could see that Hitler was going to overrun every damn thing he, he could. Right. And it was all going to be Nazi. And Nazism, you could see, was killing thousands of people. Of course, we didn't know all of it all the time. Right. It but gradually it, emerges as the it, war goes on. It, it, it emerged. How a man was that? Well, he had to be psychotic or nuts, one or two, to do what he did. Right, right. And, uh, no, I... I, I it, and it was really the one of the I, one of the lessons I tell my history students is I say that we we look at World War II as the war that kind of is normal and we expect every war to be that way where the American people are unified, <laughs> very few people disagree with the war, but most conflicts in American history there there's there's controversy there people disagree there was a big anti-war movement for World War One there was a big anti-war movement for Vietnam there was a big anti-war movement in the Civil War. War of 1812, that's kind of normal, but World War II stands out in part because it was such an obvious case where uh, something had to be done. So you end up even siding with, like, Joseph Stalin, a guy you'd never side with <laughs> in, 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 under any normal circumstances. No, I agree with that part of it, but uh, I still can see 
that's just being the supreme power. And I understand when you become that kind of thing, you got to lead. Responsibility. But I think we have a lot more choosy what we go into. Vietnam, to me, was a perfect example. Of we got into something that was way over our head. There was no way that we could do anything that was going to win. The, China, the uh, North Koreans getting all this from China and that, they, they got manpower to expend. Manpower didn't mean nothing to them people. If they lost 100 men, they'd put 200 more in tomorrow. We, that's the one thing still, you know, that governs our military is the loss of human life kind of affects us what we do and how we do it. But uh, no, World War II is the one I agree with, but every one since I could come up with an argument against going. But I'm the type I would never get out and protest to get him. Right, right. That's the one thing I I hate Jimmy Carter. He brought all those guys that went to Canada back. and if, I'd have brought them back, but it would have been nutless. They would have never produced any more yellow bellies. <laughs> Could you, you talked about before you went into service, can you talk about when you came home from this and what you did in the rest of your life, if you don't mind? Family, no. what you did, if you want to talk about that. Well, I didn't want, when you come home, you know, I walked into town, there was no, you know, little town, I was the only one back. There was You're no, back in Jenner's, Pennsylvania? Yeah, there was no celebration or anything. I come home and. I was looking for work, so I got work in the mill, worked in an eight-inch roller mill, which is a sucker pulling billets out of a furnace and throwing them into the first roll. I did that for two months. In the meantime, I had put in for appointment to the state police. And when that came through, I went into the state police and went into training in Hershey. And when, and when did you get married? 46, May of 46. And did you meet your wife before the war? Or? I met her when I came back from uh, being missing in action. So that September of 44, I met okay. her. So, you know, I really knew and lived with her for 70 years. Yeah. But uh, I did that for a while and then came to, was going to have a child, and I, I think, I, I'm not exactly sure, I think I was making 115 bucks a month as a state trooper. Now, there ain't no way I can support a wife and a kid on that, and that's why the state police had a, a rule that you can't get married until you had four years in their service. Really? Wow, that's interesting. And I went in and seen the colonel, and the funny part, I had a buddy who was in the same predicament, and uh, he was going to leave a stay, but I had already gotten a job in the mill that I could take. So uh, I decided to leave it and go back to the mill, and my buddy stayed in, and. Last I seen him a couple, 15 years ago, he was a sergeant still in the state police. But I went to the, back into the mills in Johnstown and working in the car shop. and That's where I got turned on unionism. I had a nice job welding. I was making good money. They pay you piecework. That only lasted two, three days. Just somebody noticed that's a better spot than him. He had seniority, and boom, I'm done. I'm back to becoming a tacker, getting paid. 
hardly no peace work or nothing. But anyhow, that shut down, and uh, my buddy and I just said we can get a job, so we tell them we're riveters. <laughs> we went and riveted it for two, three days. <laughs> then they were tear, tearing down railway cars, they were breaking them down and used, reusing them. Went out to the dump where they were doing this, and I had never lit a burner torch, torch in my life. And I started burning. And I was, instead of burning a nice hole, I was burning holes about like that. But, but after two days, we got it down pretty damn good. And by that time, they had moved me to another position. And when the inspector came around, he was looking for the guy that was burning. <laughs> <laughs> There's no way you're going to put a rivet in that hole. <laughs> this is a car shop. It's like a railroad manufacturing place, or when you say car shop. It was or was it repair? Car shop in Johnstown, on okay. Moxham. Okay. And I did that, and then pretty soon we got laid off, and I went up to sign for unemployment, and my buddy did, and they, the guy said, I got a job over in Lachlan Town if you want it. So I go over and I sign up to be a honey guide for Rolling Rock. That's... R.K. Mellon's estate. Oh, wow. So uh, I'm a hunting guide, and all summer long we raise pheasants and we raise ducks. And raising pheasants is tricky business. you got to keep them in a round container because they develop cannibalism real quick. Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and you have to, to beak them. You put, have a little electric... He'd come down and cut their beak so they, they can't pick. And then the other thing is, when they start getting big, you got to let them out, and you don't have enough enclosed pens, so you pinion their wing. You put a harness on the wing so they can't fly. Wow. And then after a while, you take that off, and then when the fall comes, when they start them out, when you let them out, you can always tell the one that was in the pen because he's <laughs> flying like it. <laughs> so you, uh, so how, how many kids did you did you end up having, Carl? Three. Three kids, and uh, you. Well, you had mentioned that you said you got into unionism or something um, a little bit b before. Was that just kind of being in the car shop and? No, that was every job I went. Holy mackerel, you'd go to, after that, I don't know, in the 50s, I come out for about six months, and I went to the same thing in Butler, welding in a car shop. Nice job, two, three days, I'm not making any money. So I, I can see it more now as I grew older, that, you know, that, you got to take care of the older guy, but that always burned my ass. Seniority. If you were better than he was, yeah, yeah. and he's doing the job, that used to irritate the tar out of me. So, um, did you? No, you. So your career ended up being in the military, though. Again, correct. Oh yeah. So when did you rejoin? Forty-eight. I went back in. Okay. And I have continued service from forty-eight to eighty-four, between the regular. The Guard and Reserve. National Guard Reserves. Okay. And I, 48, I went back in. I, I think I may have mentioned I went back with my two brother-in-laws and we right. went down to Fort Knox, Kentucky. And if a woman ever deserved something better than what she got was my wife. There was no quarters on houses. We went out and rented from the area. I found a place that was well, my woodshed is twice as good as you know, sitting on poles and had two rooms and he had a hand water pump in the house the toilet was about close to 100 yards back behind the house and you you 
didn't need a sweep or anything because you could sweep, there'd be knot holes on the floor. <laughs> you sweep the dirt <laughs> through that sucker. <laughs> and it was coming close to fall. And I knew that you never could eat that sucker. So they started opening up the barracks. They were taking barracks, and I don't know if you're familiar with the barracks. There's two floors, and the bottom floor has two little rooms here, and the rest is open bay. And upstairs, the same thing, two rooms, open bay. Now, all they did was take this building and put petitions up making rooms. They didn't put any insulation, nothing, just studs. So anyhow, I get a, a, a quarters in there and it started getting cold and I'm taking cardboard and nailing it up against the boards. And they didn't change the latrine system. All five, they made five apartments out of it. Used the same latrine system. You had a sign, male, female. You went in there with five or six commodes, two or three urinal, and that was it. And he had a big coal fired furnace that we took turns firing. But when you went to work, the wife had to take over firing that furnace. <laughs> So that was kind of tough. <laughs> so you lived uh, in Fort Knox just while you were kind of retraining, and then you ended up coming back to Western Pennsylvania again. No, I came. I first I got to go a little further. I finally got a job teaching in the supply school. Okay. And three of the guys were there, had been officers. And they were, got rifted, and they became senior NCOs. And they encouraged me to go before a board to get a commission. I did, and I got the commission in the reserves. And then they talked me into applying for active duty. So I do. I get active duty, and where am I going? I'm going to Japan. So I get to Japan, and I didn't know diddly about an infantry outfit. Was this Okinawa, or would it? You no, know, it was down Sasebo, okay. the further south as you could go. Right. I get in, and the division commander was General Caliph. I don't know if you know the name. He's the one at the Battle of the Bald, said oh, okay. nuts. Oh, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. Are you going to well, surrender nuts, right? Yeah. He, he was the division commander, but okay. I get down there. And they make me machine gun platoon leader. Now, I, in the Air Force, all I did was shoot it. The armor come out, right. put it in. You come back, the armor took it off, cleaned it up, and that was it. So I knew about the operation of the gun. <laughs> so here I'm to teach these guys, the, 19, the M19 and the M17 machine guns. That's all 30, cur uh, 30 caliber. The one's water cooled and the other's air cooled. So I study day and night and I'm doing that pretty good. So I finally get quarters where I could bring the wife over. And I told her she just absolutely uh, was coming. So I, I tried to get to a home and bring her back. And they wouldn't do that. But they left a buddy of mine go home because his wife was running around on him. <laughs> I figured, it's on you. <laughs> so I re resigned and went home. And I, at that time, I, what the hell did I do? 51. I can't remember what kind of work I did. Oh, I came here to Pittsburgh and uh, my. Sister lived out North Hills, and uh, I got working with Brown and somebody on his Bill Gnomes. And I got working with an old Dutchman who was a cement finisher. So I 
poured concrete cellars and basements and walks all summer long. And then in the 50s, we had that big snow. We had a driveway down. It was a double wide and a, I forget how long. It wasn't really that long. But the snow came down, and there was no way you could finish that sucker. It just piled snow. You so I didn't have any work for, for a couple of months. In the meantime, I had <coughs> tried to buy a home, and I was by the out by Bakerstown, and I had used my World War II bonus for a down payment, and I was living in it, paying the guy rent until I could uh, quarter it or get the deed done. <coughs> so I got a job in butler welding. It was, it was the same thing through <laughs> no winter. I didn't work there too long. I got laid off and I got a job down in Edna in a pipe mill. And by that time, I get recalled back up. So I'm going to go to Fort Knox again. And the wife's not going to stay there by herself. She didn't drive a car. This was more or less out in the country. You couldn't walk to the store. You couldn't. So I bring her back home. And I go down to Fort Knox. And this time, they had built new quarters, condominiums, and I got a hell of a nice apartment. And brought her down there, and uh, that's when I got back into the instructing again. And I had a little run-in with the battalion commander. He was colored. Every time I would flunk a colored guy in the school, he'd call me in, and I'd ask to justify why I flunked him. I had two or three of them. They'd just sit there all day in the class and sleep. I'd walk down the aisle, kick them in the shins. I'd do every damn thing. You couldn't keep them. So I guess he expected me to pass them. So I said, I got out of that. I got an assignment with the MPs, and I became a assistant confinement officer in the stockade. We had probably 600 people in the stockade, and, and that was kind of interesting, but it was kind of boring at the same time. Every morning you'd put them out to work and bring them back, and you'd search them, and yet. Every time we'd go around and have a shakedown, you'd come back with a mattress cover full of junk that they weren't supposed to have. And they were getting doped into the stockade and every damn thing. But that's when I get called down to school in Benny. See, that's the one thing they could, uh, the, the Army was doing things so differently and quickly. The first thing they should have done when I got commissioned was send me to basic officers, which they didn't do. Now, which means that I couldn't go into combat because I hadn't been to basic officers. Well, this was 52 already, and I hadn't been to basic, so, so I go down as a as a first lieutenant by that time to go through basic officers. And then I go through that and they ship me out to Camp Stone and to go to Korea. And we was on the boat going into Korea. When the war ended, I got to Korea and they didn't need that many people over anymore. So I got the heck out. Well, did you notice a difference between the Korean War and World War II? Like, 
Well, the you, big, biggest difference, and it causes a hell of a big change in the military. Virtually all the Korean participants, particularly enlisted, were older sergeants from World War II, and they just absolutely could not hack it day after day, putting in 24, 48 right. hours. Right. Uh, so that changed right after that. They come out with a, they called it ROPA. You could only be in a certain grade so many years, and plus that, you had to have the education for it, and you had an age limit on what you could be right. at, at a certain grade. Right. But that was the trouble. So, well, you're taking it forward too. All your generals were in their 50s, 60s, and older. Right. Those days are long gone. Yeah. The guys are in their 40s, 50s at the most. Right. They're in the general ranks. So that ROPA really helps. And, of course, it hinders you in a certain extent because you can only be a sergeant so long. If you're not promoted, you're out. But for every promotion you needed to go to a school to get qualified right, for it. Right. So in that sense, they have a better educated and trained army. Right, kind of learning from past mistakes. Yeah. Um, so how long have you lived here at this house for? 57. Since 1957. So your kids graduated from Moon High School, is that right? And what, and what, uh, you had three, and so what are they, what are they all doing now? Well, two of them are retired, but the boy's retired and the girl's retired. And the young one has just got a job with some pharmaceutical company at South Point. She went Korean? to... Korean? Huh? Is it Korean? I don't know. Uh, if it is, it's a family member. She, uh... Graduated from California. The other two went to trade schools. And uh, of course, I can't kick the girl and the, my oldest daughter. Married and she worked for U.S. Air. Her husband worked for U.S. Air. He got up to be some kind of senior director. Was, operations. He became a trustee of U.S. Air Credit. Oh, okay. Later became Clearly. president of U.S. Air Credit. He became mayor of McDonald for three terms. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so he, so did, they're what both. What trades did your sons do? Huh? What trade? What were your sons' trades? My son started out as a draftman. Right. He went to school for draftsman. And later he ended up into sales, he, indoor sales. His wife graduated from Robert Moore's and she did all the, I call it pathology, I don't know if that's right. She, she did all the biopsies through this electronic microscope for Children's Hospital. Oh, okay. She spent, I think, 45 years doing that. So they're all fairly, fairly decent, except, see, we had, there was 14 years between the two girls. Oh, wow. I meant to call her Oops. <laughs> so a boy and two girls. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. But I don't think there's anybody in this planet that lived here longer. Yeah, right, right, right. There's two original ones, two widows that are, they moved in after me, but they're still living in the plan. So about a year ago, um, one of the other things I worked on with the Oral History Center um, was we uh, interviewed people who grew up at Mooncrest when it was a defense housing community. And folks your age, you know, in their 80s, who uh, were kids or, you know, uh, teenagers, living in Mooncrest. Their parents worked for the Drabeau Corporation. A lot of them served in the military also. But they all remembered the big snow. And they call it the big snow, just like you referred to it, in the early 50s. Oh, man. And some of the photographs that they gave us for the project were photographs of them in 
in, in the snow. And, I, and they said that was like the most memorable moment of their of their childhood. They're you know some of them are a little bit younger than you, but they they said it was unbelievable. Well, I li lived in Butler, the house I was telling you. I got up, I was going to go deer hunting. I couldn't get it out of my driveway. Yeah. I shovel my driveway to get it up the road. I can't get it off the road. <laughs> right. So two days later, I finally get mad and I put the wife and kids in the car. I broke snow the whole way up Washington Boulevard. Just to, the yeah. only car going. I get as far as Irwin to get it on the turnpike. It was closed. They were going to make me. Down. They was going to make me stay in the fire hall, in Irwin, to keep me off the road. I said, I turn around and drive back home. It's Butler. And I couldn't wow, get. Wow, that's really far. I couldn't get change. I said, nowhere. You couldn't pick up change. Nothing. I went with bare ass tires. <laughs> it just shows you when you're young, you don't have a hell of a lot of sense. Yeah, right. Well, again, uh, thank you very much. This was really a lot of fun. See, when I moved here, Mooncrest was the only place to move. Right? That's where the school was. The police station was there. This was the first development. Yeah. Right, right. I don't, there's a guy named Carl Griffith. He's a, he worked for Prudential. He's a realtor. But he was the constable in the 50s, and he helped out. He's you know friends with a lot of folks around here. So he, like, found people to interview. So he was... Good. He's a good guy. He's in his like late seventies, so he was in the military too. But it was in like the late fifties, early sixties. So he was the guy who kind of helped out. Yeah, when I moved here, there was nothing. Right, right. A little bit of a West Hill or Sharon Hill North. Right. A couple of houses in there. Yeah. Yeah. And then Carno, obviously. Yeah, a little bit there. Inter interchange. And then Moon Run, there was like, wasn't there a coal mine down there? Or? Yeah, there's a coal mine there. Right. The corner of University, you had Floyd's Grocery. Right. You had the beer, joined the cross. You made, did you know the Brunettes? The, the Brunette family? They owned a, a, like a dry cleaner. Oh, yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then up on where Nissan is, you had Otto had a bowling alley. And there was a service station down where the Sunoco is about. And that was about it. Right, right. Yeah, it's really amazing how much this area has grown in the last 50 years or so. And a guy I knew down in Corey, I got to know him when I was uh, Johnny Schwartz. He bought up most of that property coming up university. Okay. But he they, did well then. <laughs> they caught up to him and his son. They, they tell me cheating on taxes and stuff. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, thank you. No problem. You good? Yeah, you I think, yeah, that was great. Thank that was you, fantastic. Sir. Anything was else awesome. you want to say? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>